running a little bit late this evening. I've had to do some reprogramming of the maps. You're going to see some improvements here and there, but let's head on and see what's coming up, starting with extreme weather around the world. The world's hot spot is Jarvis, Australia, near Alice Springs, 115 degrees there. What does Jarvis look like? Probably about like you would expect. A lot of red dirt and brush. And the world's cold spot today is Yurti, Russia, with minus 66 Fahrenheit. That's going to be in that cold bowl, not too far from Oymyakon. Here's a look at the landscape around there. This is Agayakon, maybe 50 miles away. And this shows you that taiga, vegetation, and these hills, which are very important for locking the air mass in place. And when you lock the air mass in, it helps preserve the radiational inversion. And that can help trap cold air in these valleys. Here's the surface analysis for this afternoon. A new cold front working through the Midwest. Temperatures behind it, not terribly cold. Looking at just upper 20s and 30s. So this is certainly on the mild side of cold air outbreaks. It's driven by this 1028 millibar high across North Dakota and some snow associated with that air mass. Down to the south, we have this transitional air mass. Temperatures are in the 40s and 50s. And down in Florida, we find the actual tropical air dew points in the 50s and lower 60s. And that is supporting this weather system west of Florida. Some rain bands associated with that, but they're moving rapidly to the east and we're going to find that probably on the East Coast when we start looking at the current products. In the western U.S., another southern stream system moving through California. At the time we did this analysis, it was in the Colorado River Valley, the Imperial Valley, and moving into Arizona. And a series of occlusions up in Nevada producing some snow in the higher terrain of the Great Basin region. The infrared satellite imagery does show that those bands associated with that front have advanced into Arizona. Some stronger vertical motion around Kingman up towards Cedar City. You can see the wrap around the uh, so-called comma head up there in the Great Basin area. And that's where we're going to find the upper level trough for the upper level vortex. So there's how it looks on the heights and vorticity chart. Looks like that vortex is right around Las Vegas. However, the jet itself hanging back over the coast and flowing into Arizona, and that's where we're finding a lot of the stronger upper level lift. Over the next couple of days, that's going to advance into Texas. There it is spreading into the state by tomorrow and into the southeastern U.S. Let me show you the Q vectors. This is one way we can diagnose upward vertical motion, and we can see that some of the stronger motion in the mid-levels is over western Arizona at this time, and there's subsidence working into the Los Angeles-San Diego area. During the overnight hours, this upper-level lift will move into the Four Corners area. We do have winter storm warnings and winter weather advisories for parts of the Four Corners area. Winter storm warning in the Gallup area, three to seven inches expected there, and further to the east around Clayton, Raton, Las Vegas. They're looking for four to eight inches with over a foot above 8,000 feet. What is causing all that? Well, you can look at the layout of the air masses here. This indicates some of the dynamics that are playing into this weather system. You can see the thickness gradient across Arizona, lots of thickness contours, which indicates a thermal gradient in the lowest several kilometers of the atmosphere. So that's going to support a front roughly in this area here. The warm front is not quite as well defined, but I would say it's something like that. And you can see the precip trailing on the backside, which is a classic Anna front setup. And we see a lot of those on the west coast. Going into the overnight hours, there's that precipitation band moving into New Mexico and through the state around dawn. At this time, looks like the front is well to the south around maybe just north of Chihuahua. And the warm front, again, that's not really all that resolvable, but 
maybe south of El Paso, with a occlusion extending northward. And this here is some of the precept, maybe associated with the cold conveyor belt and the comma head, which may look something like that. We're probably starting to develop that warm conveyor belt, that deep warm conveyor belt tapping that tropical air. So we're getting kind of a setup where the cloud field looks somewhat like that. And back here, we find the dry slot, which is punching into the backside of the system. So those are some things you can look for when you go through the charts and the satellite data. And as that emerges into Texas, yeah, it might help to have some wind barbs. So there they are. That'll help you track the fronts. And as it emerges, you can see this warm conveyor belt precip really expand because we're getting that interaction with tropical moisture. So lots of convection and growth of the precipitation area up north and even some wet bulbing. You can see snow developing from Fort Smith up to Enid, Wichita, and Woodward for late tomorrow night into Friday morning. And there it goes. You can see the dry slot following the system. And meanwhile, we get new development of a new Bear Clinic low on the Gulf Coast. So the fronts at this point are looking something like that. You can see warm frontal precipitation right there. If we had a little bit more instability, that would be a good setup for severe weather. But I'm not too sure we have that. And this will take you through the rest of the sequence on up towards Saturday and Sunday. Coastal low off the northeast coast. And here we go again. Yet another frontal system. Let's do that a little bit more accurately. Maybe something like that. And there we go. So it is definitely including. And that's because that ribbon of thickness values runs right through that zone in Arizona. Okay. And you can see this one's developing into a major weather system by Tuesday. We're probably going to see pressures down to eight, 980 millibars across the Midwest. That's going to be near record territory for the Ohio River Valley. And when we get that, there's often some very strong winds associated with those deep lows. So we could see winds gusting up to maybe 50 or 60 miles an hour. And this could be blizzard conditions locally in some areas of Illinois. And there's that system on its way out. And we'll just kind of look at the rest of it shortly. But it looks like another nose of cold air coming in from Canada. And as we head up the Pacific, it continues to be stormy in the North Pacific region. And we've got this hurricane force low in the Gulf of Alaska. And this is what we're talking about. 946 millibar low this morning in the Aleutians. That was actually a little bit deeper earlier, but it's starting to fill. Nevertheless, significant amounts of westerly flow. That was a hurricane force low out there, and that westerly flow generating a lot of wave energy, large swells, and that will keep the beaches hazardous on the west coast over the next several days. And we are definitely seeing some big changes across the Arctic. Temperatures as cold as minus 36 up there at Old Crow. The Canadian Weather Service has an extreme cold warning for that area due to that extreme cold and windshield conditions. And there's minus 38 at Colville Lake. They've got an extreme cold warning as well. The core of the Arctic air is right there over Nunavut and the eastern Northwest Territories. And some of that's starting to move into the Canadian Prairie Provinces to the south. So one reason we're a little bit delayed is because I was working on this graphic trying to get the color scheme right. I've got these oranges for minus 25 and below. And as we go forward into Friday and Saturday, you can follow along and kind of get an idea of the extent of this cold air mass. You can see a little bit of expansion, maybe a tiny bit of weakening, but the oranges really come back for Sunday going into Monday. See up there, we're getting into minus 30s across a huge swath of the Arctic. Now, we don't have the significant anticyclogenesis, the pressure rises, and so forth that we typically see with strong Arctic outbreaks. So this is not going to be in a hurry to come south just yet. But this is a big change from what we've seen over the past few weeks. Typically, the air up here has been in the minus 10 to 0, maybe even 10 above range. In part, that was due to this well-developed Hudson Bay low. Well, it's not on here, but it was slinging a bunch of warm air back around 
into the Northwest Territories. And that prevents that cold air from really building. But now, yeah, minus 40s all the way into Saskatchewan by midweek. So this is a change. And you can see now we're starting to build 1048, maybe 1050 millibars. So this is a shift in gears into more of a deep freeze January pattern. So now we have high pressure across the Canadian prairies, across the Northwest Territories. And now that cold air is coming south. And there it is moving into the Dakotas. A little bit of modification, but we're still hanging on to minus 20s and minus 30s in the prairies. And there it comes south. And that's going to be the last frame I have right there. I don't feel it's worth going beyond 240 hours because there can be so many changes. But you can see some of that cold air starting to get entrenched right there. That's going to bring the heights down in the western U.S. and some of the cold air also in Montana. So this will start sinking into the Great Basin area, the Dakotas, and maybe even parts of the northern U.S. over maybe uh, the next 7 to 10 days. And I'll show you one other interesting thing. I've brought this back to the current time. Let's focus on this area right here, Yukon to British Columbia. You can see up north, minus 35 down to the south, 20s and 30s. The uh, dark purple, that's going to be about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's run that forward. You're going to see that cold air start to build up north in the Yukon. And there it is. See that big wall of cold air starting to come south around midweek. And that pushes all the way into the valleys. Look at that minus 10 to minus 20 showing up in the Fraser River Valley. And that is definitely noteworthy for Pacific Northwest weather. That's where we get the intense gap winds in places like Vancouver, Seattle, down to the south in the Cascades. And that cold air is probably going to continue working all the way down into the Columbia and Snake River Valley. And there's also the possibility of severe weather in the southeast for next week. Let's bring this forecast sequence forward. There comes system number one through Texas for tomorrow. That moves on to the east. Not really seeing much in the way of severe weather for that round. Then we get the next wave coming through on Sunday. That's going to be the big one as it emerges into the central U.S. And right here, Alabama, Georgia, well, this is 6 a.m. A lot could change between now and then as far as timing. But right before that hits, you can see these strong, gusty southeast winds up as high as 30 knots, which means highly stretched photograph profiles and probably even curved photograph profiles. Let me show you the 850 millibar chart. So here it is for late Monday next week, and we've already got 50 to 65 knot flow at 850. So that is significant. That's also bringing up a lot of warmth and moisture, high theta E parcels, and it accelerates even further, increases to 75 knots at 850. That's extremely high. Again, a lot could change between now and then. Also, 6 a.m., that's not really the optimal time for severe weather. And it's a very fast-moving system. This is later in the day on Tuesday, so already advancing to Virginia and North Carolina. There could be another severe weather outbreak there as well. We'll have to see about that. The, the timing is very sensitive to how accurate these models are. But it does look like somewhere in the southeastern U.S. the potential for some severe weather. And we'll take a look at the snowfall prospects. You're going to see the snow track develop across New Mexico going into tomorrow. Most of the precip is going to be up in the higher elevations, a little bit less in the valley floors and on the plains. Looks like maybe two to four inches around Clayton. And that expands eastward into Oklahoma and Kansas. The GFS going for about maybe two inches there. And then it moves on off to the east. Here comes round two from the west. This looks like it has more extensive snowfall. That's one thing we can surmise. The GFS going more aggressive with that. And even all the way down into Tucson, it's going for some measurable amounts. Tucson, Bisbee, Douglas, and even down towards Chihuahua. Anyway, things move on off to the east. Dry slot through Texas, shutting down the precept there. 
And you can see this snow track extending currently from south of Wichita through Missouri and up to Chicago for months. And due to this being a very deep 980 millibar low with a very strong pressure gradient, I think we're going to see a lot of snow on the ground get lofted. We may see winter storm warnings and maybe some blizzard warnings come out across parts of the Corn Belt out there in Illinois, Iowa, and Missouri. And as far as temperatures, let's take a quick look at that. Most of the country is going to be near seasonal normals, maybe a little bit warm down on the Gulf Coast. But going into next week, Midweek, of course, is where we're going to see those big changes. You can see it's cooling down up there in Canada. And we start seeing some bitterly cold air showing up in Montana by Wednesday. There's those sub-zero conditions coming south. And it gets even worse. That's going to be on Thursday. Minus 20s showing up there just west of Minot. And some of it starts filtering south. It's probably a little bit too early to nitpick the models, but... We're definitely looking at changes in the northwestern U.S. and the northern plains. Okay, it's gotten really late, so I need to get this rendered and uploaded. I'll leave you with some footage, thanks to Greg, out there in the Texas Hill Country. And, of course, at the very end, I'm going to go ahead and give you those cross-sections. Not enough time to really discuss that. But if you like them, please comment so I know that somebody's looking at them. All right. Hope you have a great, what is it, Wednesday evening, and we'll see you back here on Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.